Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord, our risen and ascended Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Everyone loves a good sequel. I think you know what I mean. After you have watched that wonderful film that captured your attention and it comes to an end, you look to the one sitting to your right or to your left and you say, I wonder what comes next. Or you finish that wonderful novel that perhaps ends on a cliffhanger and you ask, when will the author deliver the sequel? I need to know how this is going to end. Hollywood's long understood this, and that's why they pump out movie after movie, continuing on a theme. Authors understand it as well. They like to hook our attention. But I said everyone loves a good sequel. Unfortunately, sometimes there are some not-so-good sequels, sequels that simply do not live up to the first edition, and they kind of leave you a little disappointed. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, what we have before us this morning in the opening words from the book of Acts is far greater than any blockbuster sequel or any man-written word. But it's okay to talk about it in those terms. Just ask Theophilus. <coughs> Are you familiar with his name, Theophilus? He is the recipient of not one, but two of the books of the Bible. Theophilus was the one to whom St. Luke wrote his gospel account, Matthew, Mark, Luke. That third gospel account written to Theophilus to explain to him the works and the life and the death and the resurrection of his Lord, Jesus the Christ. But it didn't stop there. For as Theophilus would come to understand, that was only the beginning. For he also was the one who received from St. Luke the Acts of the Apostles, that book which now explains how the Christian church would continue on after that amazing time in which Christ walked this earth. And he would come to find out that the ascension of our Lord was the majestic hinge upon which the sequel now begins. A spirit-driven sequel. You see, in the opening words from Acts, you heard it read by Pastor just moments ago, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up into heaven. There are many people in the Bible that I would like to meet and talk with, but I wonder what it would be like to have that conversation with Theophilus, perhaps someone who knew very little about this Jesus, very little about this history of Christianity, and yet one to whom Luke wrote the Gospel accounts. And how does Luke start this sequel to Theophilus? He says, remember, Theophilus, everything that I have already laid out for you to see. He goes on to say, before Jesus was taken on into heaven, don't forget that after his sufferings, He presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Like any good author, you see what Luke is doing. He's reminding Theophilus of the content of his first work. And so focus with me for a moment on those three items that Luke mentioned. He says, you remember, Theophilus, how we talked about the suffering of our Lord. Now, I have no doubt that when you hear the word suffering and the word Jesus in the same sentence, it's pretty natural to jump right away to the last week of his life, to the time when Jesus stood before Pontius Pilate, 
to when Jesus was on the cross giving his life for our sins, and yet, isn't it true that we could really use that term suffering for so much more? Think about what Christ endured here. In fact, in theological terms, we could say his entire life here on earth is part of his state of humiliation or suffering. That is to say, when he willingly chose not to make full use of his divine power, being true God, he allowed himself to be born as one of us. He allowed himself to grow as one of us. He allowed himself to be taunted by human beings. He allowed himself to feel the things that we feel, but he did it in such a way that he maintained his perfection. But suffering? He certainly went through that for the 33 years of his life up until the point of his death. But then Luke reminds us, after the resurrection, Jesus gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. We've just come off those convincing proofs. In the past 40 days, how did Jesus spend his post-resurrection life? He went to his disciples many times in many ways saying, It is I. I accomplished that what I set out to do. I who gave my life as the, the Lamb of God, the sacrifice for your sins, I have taken it back up. The victory is secure. I am here. You can touch me. You can see me. And of course, Luke summarizes the work that Jesus carried out while he was here as Jesus speaking about the kingdom of God instructing the disciples and any who would care to hear about the true nature of the kingdom of God, not a physical, earthly kingdom, but rather a spiritual kingdom that you and I are blessed to be a part of. As we have come to faith and see Christ for who he truly is, the Savior of this world, the Savior of, of us. Luke wanted Theophilus to remember the core content of that first book. And it's pretty obvious why. Because when you think about those things, Christ's sufferings, the convincing proofs that Christ is alive, and the nature of Christ's kingdom, we realize just how little and incapable we are without Christ. For who of us can look at the sufferings of Christ and not be reminded of just how deep of a hole in which we found ourselves? That we needed one to come and take our place and pay for the sins that we have piled up day in and day out. And convincing proofs of his life well, which of us was going to give our life on the cross only to be able to take it up again? The answer is, none of us could, and I don't think any of us would have. An instruction about the kingdom of God? We were so confused, wondering what the important concept of God's kingdom truly would be. We needed one to teach us, to instruct us, to change our heart to see it, and there Luke is pointing us to Christ throughout his gospel account. Now imagine Theophilus' perspective. Perhaps tearing page after page of St. Luke saying, I can't help but get more. Tell me what's going to happen next. Show me the next thing that Jesus is going to do. When he gets to the Good Friday and he reads the account of Christ's crucifixion, can you imagine the tears streaming down his eyes only to get to Easter Sunday and see he is risen, he is risen indeed. Now what's going to happen? He wants to know what the sequel is going to be. That incredible summary laid out for Theophilus by St. Luke is waiting for a sequel. And Luke's not done. 
and neither are we, because today when we celebrate the ascension, we are reminded of the spirit-driven sequel that doesn't just reflect on Christ's past work, but it reshapes our lives as well. You know who was ready for a sequel? I think the disciples were. After everything they had endured, following Jesus in that special way for three years during his public ministry, watching him die on the cross and going through that moment of temporary despair only to see Christ now convincingly prove that he is alive. The disciples perhaps were waiting for a sequel like none other. Which is why when we have in this account from Acts chapter 1, the question, it really doesn't surprise us. Did you hear what they asked Jesus as he was preparing to ascend into heaven? He says, they say, then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They wanted the sequel to start and they wanted it on their terms. And the sequel they wanted was glory. Is it now, Lord? Now that you have conquered death, now that you have shown yourself victorious, can you set up an earthly kingdom here and can we reign with you? Because the hard work is finished and now we simply want to rest in your presence and bring on the accolades of being called Christians, those who can stand in your presence forever. Is it now, Lord? And the answer is no. There would be a sequel but it perhaps was not the one the disciples was waiting for, were waiting for, and most likely not the ones we would have been waiting for. Because Jesus then left. And as we've talked about, he didn't leave when he ascended into heaven because he was tired of the disciples. He didn't leave because he was tired of his work and needed to retire. He did not leave because he was tapped out and simply said, I need to regather myself and my thoughts, he left because he had a better plan in mind as he took the right hand of the Father and as he began governing the events of the world in all of the glory that was always belonging to him once again. But before he does so, he reminds his disciples what the sequel really is all about. He focuses the attention from his work on our behalf in saving the world to now his work through us in bringing that message to others. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Those were the words that were left ringing in the disciples' ears as they watched Jesus ascend into heaven. Those were the words that were used to reshape the purpose of the disciples' lives as they were entering this spirit-driven sequel. With such a command from their loving Savior, can you imagine the amount of excitement and activity that must have started off? And yet, what do we see in activity? Paralysis. You see the disciples looking up with gaping mouth. So much so that it was necessary for an angel to say, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? I'll tell you exactly why they were standing there. It wouldn't have been easy to see Jesus leave again. Can't you imagine putting yourself in their situation and asking the question, do we have to go through this again? The roller coaster continues. The disciples who saw their Savior taken from them on the cross, only to 
pull themselves up, lock themselves up in that upper room, and then see proof that Christ had taken his life back again, the resurrection Lord. But all oh, the emotional turmoil of thinking we lost our Savior only to receive him again, and now Jesus on his own will is leaving them, and you wonder if they're not thinking, here we go again. Knowing their thoughts and knowing their minds, knowing our thoughts and knowing our minds, the same type of mind that is evident when you go to work in the morning and you turn on the television in the morning and you talk with your coworkers in the morning and you see evidence after evidence of a world that seems to be not heading in the right direction or simply falling apart and you wonder, here we go again, Lord, where did you go? I could use you now. Remember the comfort that was given by the angels on the day of the ascension. This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And with that certainty of Christ's enduring care, and presence. We're called to action. Having calmed the hearts of the disciples, the spirit-driven sequel is on, and it reshaped their purpose and their function. And as you read through the book of Acts, another 28 chapters worth, you will see how the Lord, the Lord of the church, our ascended Lord, worked through the disciples, through men like Peter, through Paul, through Silas, through Barnabas, and countless others to do what? To be his witnesses. And we see that message. It starts in Jerusalem. It starts in Jerusalem where the disciples would receive in a special way the power of the Holy Spirit. We call that the day of Pentecost. But it continued on as the Holy Spirit continues to dwell in not only their hearts, but the hearts of all believers who come to faith that they might share the faith. And here's the exciting thing on this celebration of the ascension. The Spirit-driven sequel, the work of being Christ's witnesses, the end of the story hasn't been written yet. Because you continue to serve us as witnesses. Because we continue to have the opportunity to take that very message, the same message, and take it maybe not to Judea, maybe not to Samaria, but to new ends of the earth, even now, as we who have been blessed through the word of Christ to be witnesses of the work of Christ, just as Theophilus was, to see what he has done and to know that forgiveness of sins is a reality, to know that we have the comfort and the peace of being at one with our God, we now get to take that in whatever vocation we have, be it pastor or teacher, doctor or lawyer, factory worker or stay-at-home mother, And we get to share it with others. Some sequels simply don't live up to their billing. But when Luke wrote to Theophilus the book of Acts, nothing could be further from the truth because he allows Theophilus and also you and me to reflect on what Christ has done for us and what he now does through us. On this Ascension Day celebration, the spirit-driven sequel continues. Amen.